A reading from the book of Malachi. See, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when all the arrogant and all evildoers will be stubble. The day that comes shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts so that it will leave them neither root nor branch. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read our psalm this morning responsively. By half verse. Sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm, has he has won, won for himself, himself the victory. The Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he openly shown in the sight of the nations. He remembers his mercy and faithfulness to the house of Israel, and all the ends of the earth have seen the victory. Shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands. Rejoice and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn, Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the land and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. In righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. A reading from the second letter to Paul to the Thessalonians. Now we command you, beloved, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to keep away from believers who are living in idleness and not according to the tradition that they received from us. For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us. We were not idle when we were with you. And we did not eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day so that we might not burden any of you. This was not because we do not have that right, but in order to give you an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we gave you this command. Anyone unwilling to work would not eat. For we hear that some of you are living in idleness, mere busybodies, not doing any work. Now such persons we command and exhort in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. Brothers and sisters, do not be weary in doing what is right. The word of the Lord. Thanks. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. 
When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. Then they asked him, Teacher, when will this be? And what will be the sign that this is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray. For many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified. For these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes, and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify. So make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give to you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But not one hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Grace to you and peace. Please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Not a very happy gospel this morning, would you say? <laughs> we often talk in the church about context, and often what we do with context is try to soften Scripture in such a way that it doesn't really say anything to us now. So we say Old Testament, New Testament gospel readings are in a different context so we can back off from them and we can take from them any power that they have because they're not really talking to us. That's actually called historicism, and it's not what we do here in church. Context is this. Context is, so for instance, the gospel that we read this morning follows right after the widow's might when this older, poor woman goes to the temple and offers, as Jesus says, everything she had to live on. That's the context, or the context in Second Thessalonians, for, in, for instance, is it's a prayer. It's a prayer that calls people into the work and the mission of God and blesses them for those things. The context in Malachi is that the prophet is saying, listen. That's context. That doesn't have anything to do with the history. That's just where it falls in Scripture. But if you want to talk about history, let's talk about now. You may have heard, if you've been paying some attention, that we had an election this past week. And you may have heard that half of the country is really excited about the outcome, and the other half is not so much. You haven't heard this. You awfully got, you got really quiet when I started talking about politics. That says something to me. It's interesting, though, as divided of a nation as we seem to be at this moment, there's something that keeps coming to my mind, and it's come to yours, too, all week long. The Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's a fabulous line, don't you think? One nation under God, indivisible. I love that. The people who framed that, the person who framed that, a guy named Francis Bellamy, by the way, in 1892, um, uh, when they framed those words, he was a, he was a Presbyterian minister too. Um, he framed those words. He knew very well following all the wars that this country had been in and all the differences of opinion, that we were not all alike. He understood our differences. He knew that different does not mean necessarily indivisible or divisible. He knew that we could be different and be united. He knew that our differences are not what define us. What defines us 
is the fact that we are all children of one God. We'll set aside the fact that that under God uh, phrase wasn't actually added until 1954 under President Eisenhower with the threat of communism, which is considered to be an ungodly thing. Nonetheless, it's our Pledge of Allegiance. It makes sense. We are all children of God. That's not necessarily a Christian formation. It just means that when it comes to government and living as a nation, there is something bigger than us. It's a fabulous line. I love it. So you could say that in our historical moment and in the context in which we live, that there is something bigger than just what's going on now. There is a future there has been a past, but the most important thing is way out there. It's where we're heading as a people. But if you want to talk about what we might do now following an election, I think it's fair to point out a few things. One is this. We have a fabulous opportunity right now, a wonderful opportunity an opportunity that begs us to see past our petty differences, and they're petty, and to see in ourselves a certain unity, a certain pull towards loving one another and having compassion for one another. It's a fabulous line in our gospel that gives people, as Jesus says, you have an opportunity to testify to God's love whenever things go crazy. Now is that opportunity for us. To testify to that which is bigger than we are, to God's love, God's compassion, God's justice, the call for us to care for the poor, the homeless, the immigrants, the needy, the strangers, the people who look differently than we are, the people who love differently than we do. The second thing we might try in this moment in history is to actually be the church. And I don't mean coming here and coming to church on Sunday. I mean actually being what we were created to be, which is a people united in God, with God, in, G in the work of Jesus Christ to carry out the mission of God in this world. That is what the church is. You don't come to church. You take the church with you. We take the church with us when we leave here. An opportunity to be the church it's also an opportunity for us, a huge opportunity for us, to get to know people who think differently than we do, to take this as an opportunity to step across a divide and to befriend someone who thinks differently and to cultivate that relationship. It's a wonderful line in the prayer attributed to St. Francis, seek, so not, seek not so much to be understood, but to understand. There's a certain godly wisdom in that and none of us lies outside that call. The last thing we might try doing is taking some time to confess that perhaps how we viewed our world over the last little bit has not been helpful. Perhaps to confess to God and our neighbors, as we will do in a little while, that we have been very critical of other people who actually aren't that different than us. We have decided to demonize those who think differently than we do and who might have created an outcome that we didn't want. We have decided to take part in a fear and a hateful speech kind of thing, all of us. Perhaps what we need to do is all get on our knees, perhaps join our hands and ask God to forgive us as a community and as individuals, as we move forward, that's the next step. To start again. To realize we are forgiven. To move forward in forgiveness and in love and compassion for those around us. Everything's done at this point. All we have is what's out there. So speaking of context and speaking of history and speaking of prophets and letters in the New Testament and Jesus' own words in, in the gospel. There's certain, there's, I don't know how this happened, and I know I just sat here and said, don't worry about context and historicism, <laughs> but it seems very uncanny that the lessons that we have this week seem to be speaking to who we are. Malachi, the prophet, probably this, that, that book, by the way, if you're interested in biblical kind of stuff, um, Malachi's 
um, prophecy, his, his prophetic words, are the last prophetic writings in the Nevi'im, which is, which is the, um, the writings in the Hebrew Bible. It's not the last thing in our Old Testament, just in the Hebrew Bible, it's the last part of the prophetic writings for those of you who care about that kind of thing. Um, but Malachi is talking to a people who seem divided. They're divided politically, they're divided economically, they're divided in how they worship. They're divided in the ways they see each other. They begin to denigrate those who don't think like they do. Interesting, interesting context, don't you think? And then he says, the son of righteousness will rise, and on those wings we will be healed. All the divisions, all the differences, everything will be healed for us, in us. And we have to take part in that healing. We don't get to sit around. And then 2 Thessalonians what's attributed to Paul or one of his disciples. Paul is saying, and we've used this all kinds of wrong ways in the past, by the way, don't be associating with those idlers, those believers who are idle. Interestingly, what Paul is writing to the the early church is about being missionaries and disciples for Christ. And that word idlers actually means, if you tear it apart, it means a disordered life and a certain stubbornness, stubbornness and obstinance. So for all those people who don't put God first, who can't say their prayers before they do anything, who can't organize their lives in such a way to realize that there is a God above us, all those people, you wanna be very careful. Those people are the same ones who are reticent to engage in a world that needs their help. Now the context here the historical context is that in 1 Thessalonians, when Paul wrote that, which, by the way, is the oldest letter in the New Testament, the first thing written in the New Testament, when Paul was writing in the mid, early to mid-50s, everybody thought Jesus was coming back right away. Jesus was going to come back in their lifetimes, and then a few years down the road in 2 Thessalonians, Paul's writing again, uh, maybe it's not going to happen so fast. Perhaps we now don't have the opportunity to sit around and wait Perhaps what we're called to is engagement in this world now. Nobody gets free lunch. We all work towards one thing, unity in God, serving the poor, loving, compassion, all those things. Just like that historical situation, Luke is writing towards the end of the first century, Writing at a time some years down the road still that Jesus has still not come back. Everybody's asking, well, when will it happen? When is this going to occur? Tell us what's going to happen. And Jesus' words are pretty much this. It's none of your business. It's none of your business when all this is going to happen. Right now. Right now is the time, no matter what's happening, and all the madness and all the craziness, right now is the time for you, you disciples, to follow me into the hard stuff, to give yourselves over to love, to desiring something bigger than we have right now, to looking at each other as being united under the work of the cross. Now, Jesus says, right now, is the time for us to order our lives in a way that love is on the top and compassion and justice and all the things that follow from there. Now's not the time to be worried about what's going to happen next. The future is God's business, not ours. So if you're sitting there thinking that the preacher's lost his mind and he's mixing politics and religion, okay, I don't care, actually. I don't even care who you voted for. That's your business, not mine. But I will say a few things about politics and religion. First of all, if the God you believe in agrees with you and your political views, you are not thinking about the same God that exists. God is beyond all that, defined further than that. Maybe there's some truth on one side. Maybe there's some truth on the other. Maybe everybody needs to unite together and let's start talking about the truth that exists in both places. Maybe we ought to look at each other and say, wait, you bring something to the table that makes some sense. Oh, but you do too. Also, the divisions that we claim in this country are about whether or not we're right or wrong. Also, none of our business 
what's right is to organize our lives and situate ourselves in this world in such a way that we can testify and witness to the love that we know here. This is not about politics. This is whether or not we can choose to do the right thing, which is, first and foremost, love. If all we can do is criticize, if all we can do is hear criticisms, we need to back up, get on our knees, start again, and reach our hands out. Our Pledge of Allegiance is an interesting thing, isn't it? We grew up saying this. Most of us in this room were probably born at a time before the under God part was there. The only part I know is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It's the only part I've ever heard. I've said it ever since I was a kindergartner every single day of my life until I think I was in the seventh grade, which would have been somewhere around 1975 or six or something like that. I might be a little younger than some of you. And then as I grew up and got through, began to go into high school and all that kind of thing, um, you know, that, that Pledge of Allegiance, we would do it one day a week in chapel. I went to a Christian school, which, um, believe it or not, was created as a white flight school, so it's not really a Christian school. It's just kind of a Christian school. Um, so I grew up saying, I grew up saying that, and then I went to college. I went to college in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which is like Boulder East, um, a very liberal place, a place where it challenged all the notions of what it means to be a, a, a world, and it challenged the notions of separation, or, or it esteemed the notions of separation between church and state. It made us consider things. What does under God mean? Does that mean that it, that it puts other people out? Is it an exclusive thing? Does it make it such that, say, Muslims or Jews or anybody else, does it make it such that they're not included in that? The answer is undeniably no. Those words, whether they've been edited or not over the last 130 or so years, 20 or so years, those words actually mean something to us. Friday was Veterans Day. Friday was a day of celebrating not just those who have served, but celebrating freedom. Friday was a day that says to us, there are do those who are willing to give a hell of a lot, maybe even their lives, for the notion that we are a free republic who depends on faith as a central part of who we are. Yes, there's such thing as the, the separation of church and state. And yes, without faith, a free republic does not exist. We happen to be in the context, to live in the context of a Christian society, you and I. Here in this community, we look to the cross, to the work of Christ. That's the only victory we know. We don't get to claim any other victories. The first thing we do is be a child of God. We can be an American down, further down the road. But the call to us now is to witness to the love that Jesus gave this world, the whole world, the big world, with all capital letters. You want to call that political, go ahead. But what it is, is the gospel. It's what we are commanded to do. Love is not an option. Unity is not an option. It's why we live. Amen. If you'll please stand. We believe in one God the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. O well, judge of the nations, we remember before you with grateful hearts the men and women of our country who in the day of decision ventured much for the liberties we now enjoy. Grant that we may not rest until all the people of this land share the benefits of true freedom and gladly accept its disciplines. Help us, O Lord, to finish the good work here begun. Strengthen our efforts to blot out ignorance and prejudice and to abolish poverty and crime. And hasten the day when all our people with many voices in one united chorus will glorify your holy name. Lord God Almighty, you have made all the peoples of the earth for your glory to serve you in freedom and in peace. Give to the people of our country a zeal for justice and the strength of forbearance that we may use our liberty in accordance with your gracious will through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We pray to you also, O oh God, for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. You can let go of your hands now. Good morning.